pocket edition proposals, otters, and I'm compressed. Join us for all these topics and more on the PGS Game Studios podcast, where adventure awaits. And welcome to another edition of the Passport Game Studios podcast, where adventure awaits. I'm your host, Chaz Marler, the social media and support manager over here at Passport Game Studios. And if you joined us for last episode, you may recall that that one was recorded live from BGGCon, where we had the luxury of not only talking face to face, but we were joined by a fourth panelist. But this time, we're back in our virtual studio, and we have shrunk back down to just two other members joining me on the panel for this episode. So let me introduce my fellow panelists who are experiencing this shrinkage with me. Let's welcome both Ryan Skinner and Scott Morris back to the show. I feel like I should talk like Alvin and the Chipmunks for this then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think you set a precedent here for some odd conversation there, Chaz. Oh, excellent. That's, that's my goal. Uh, the otter, the better. In fact, if we want to talk about otters, we, we could do that, that too. Shrinking otters? Welcome to the left turn in Albuquerque episode. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Didn't take us long at all. No, we veered right off course into the ditch right away. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for adding your voice to mine to grow our discussion uh, on today's topic game compression or making a theme or game portable or applying a shrink ray to games or making things short and sweet or the opposite of this very description. Before we get into that discussion, though, let's get back into the flow of the discussion by discussing some of the games that we've recently played. Hey, Ryan, since you're I'm pretending that you're sitting to my left, uh, let's let's start with you. Hello from your virtual left. Uh, yeah, I have been playing since coming home from BGGCon a lot of A Fake Artist Goes to New York, which I was able to purchase there at the show. Um, if you or the viewers at home, listeners at home, are not familiar, A Fake Artist Goes to New York is a sort of party game. Uh, plays up to, I think, 10 people, something like that. And it is uh, a game where one player is going to choose a word, and they're going to write that word on a bunch of little cards that they're going to give out to all the other players secretly. But one of the players is not going to receive the word. They receive just the letter X or something similar, indicating that they are, in fact, the fake artist for the round. Uh, after which, the person who chose the word passes around a little pad of paper, and all the players take turns drawing a little bit of art onto the single piece of paper to indicate what the word was that was given to them. And when it gets around, of course, to the fake artist, they're trying to decipher from the drawings or scribbles or chicken scratches, whatever it may end up looking like, uh, what the word might be so that they can blend in and also contribute to the art. Um, it's very comparable to Spyfall. If uh, anyone has ever played that, it's a little more readily available here in the States than uh, A Fake Artist. But uh, yeah, very similar games. This one is like a mashup of Spyfall and Pictionary and uh, super, super fun. We've had a lot of laughs, a lot of laughs playing this game. Um, I took it home for Thanksgiving, played it with the family, uh, played it uh, at my, you know, at the local game store with people. It was uh, it was a big hit. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Spyfall. It's one of my all-time favorites. And the fake artist goes to New York, keeps that same feel as Spyfall. And I really enjoy that one, mm -hmm. too. It, it's in that definitely in that same vein. Right. Scott, have you played a fake artist goes to New York? I have many times. Uh, in fact, the, the very first time was at a convention, uh, Gen Con, with uh, other reviewers of video games and board games. And we all got together and we started playing and we realized that <clears throat> we were playing it wrong. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was it was a late night. So, uh, but once this, once we started, you can't see. This is my surprised face. Yeah, I was shocked. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we we've, we've played that one and had a, had a good time with it. That uh, I picked that up at BGGCon last year, actually. So. Nice, cool. 
Well, uh, since it's been so long since you've played A Fake Artist Goes to New York, Scott, uh, that's disqualified for your pick. So what other game have you actually been playing recently? Recently, I have been playing a Kickstarter game that I backed and, and recently received called Hero Realms. It's from White Wizard Games. It's the uh, system that Star Realms was was based on, uh, which is a deck building game. Uh, but it takes the concept of tech building, deck building and turns it into more along the lines of trading card game combat, uh, where you're each a character and you, if you play with the advanced rules, you have some special powers, special powers that will leave you to your own devices, so to speak. You know, wizards can manipulate things, warriors can attack pretty hard and stuff like that. Uh, but the system itself is just really sound. Uh, I really, you know, Star Realms has done very well and it's been very popular. And uh, I play the app of Star Realms quite a bit. So when I saw Hero Realms was coming out and it was all fantasy based and medieval kind of based, it was uh, right up my alley. And I'm very, very happy I picked it up. It's uh, uh, very apropos for our uh, subject and topic today because it's kind of a portable game that you can take along with you. Um, but it is uh, it takes up a good amount of space on the table, but it is still a very, very fun game. Now, you've been playing something else recently as well, have you not? You you spent the weekend recently playing Star Wars Destiny? I am your father. Yes. <laughs> I have to bring it up because I am trying to fight the 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 pull to, to dive into that game. Does, does the pull of the dark side getting to you too much? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. The dark side is calling to me with that yeah. game, but I want to I want to bring it up because it's uh, I've only played a game of it, but it was pretty entertaining. Uh, I love Destiny. I think it's a great system. Uh, I think the thing I'm most excited about about Destiny, actually, being a huge Star Wars geek as I am, I'm actually really excited that it's a system and that it's something that we might be able to see other things with. You know, if you sure. think about Game of Thrones Destiny or things like that, or Lord of the Rings Destiny, that could be really, really cool too. I think the most interesting comment that has been made over the weekend, because I did play close to 21 games of Destiny over the weekend between private games and being at a tournament, um, the most interesting comment that was made was actually me telling somebody there, this game is dangerously affordable. Because the starters are $15 and you get quite a bit with them. And the boosters are only like $4 or $3, I think. Uh, I think they're three ninety nine. dollars um, not, that I, not that I know. Yeah, and um, <laughs> that's that's pretty dangerous when the artwork's really good and the gameplay's really good and the components are really good. So, yeah, I'm looking for some good things out of Destiny uh, apart from my wallet being empty. Oh, that sounds extraordinarily dangerous. It is. Uh, it is always a little dangerous when you get into, into those collectible games. But. Yes. What about you, Chaz? What have you been playing? Well, I've been well. I've been almost playing a game recently. <laughs> um, I had Seafall in my uh, online store wish list for nearly two years, it seemed like. And <laughs> it arrived and super excited about it and um, took it to one of my game group meetings a couple weeks ago. And we were excited to play it. It was going to be our main game of the night. So we played some filler and light games first and broke out Seafall and realized it had been a while since I had read the rules. So we were kind of going in very cold. So I said, you know what, let's let's find an online video and watch that for a, a refresher for the rules. And we said, okay. So we watched the video, which turned out to be 40 minutes long. Um, and then by the time that we finished the video, we played half a round and ran out of time. So I almost <laughs> played Seafall and I, I'm, I'm hope we're going to take it we're going to play it again next time we get together, but that's not going to be uh, for at least another three weeks or so, which is just enough time to need another refresher. So you see failed instead of see falled. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. The, the categorical see fail right, right there. That's fair. Yeah. The, uh, the, the approaching game night with a new game, not knowing how to play it is a, uh, it's a big misplay. <laughs> we actually have a rule yeah. in our game group that you're not allowed to bring a game to play unless you know how to teach it. Yeah, it's kind of an unspoken with my group here as well. Um, every once in a while, we, we let someone get away with bringing something that's still in the shrink wrap that they kind of say they know how to play, but it always seems to backfire. <laughs> so, yeah. Curiously enough, this was the game that the group allowed to break that rule. And, and after that experience, we reinstituted that rule for every game. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, totally fair. Uh, what's not fair 
is the quiz I'm about to spring on you. Uh-oh. Yes. Um, uh-huh. As you may know, after we kind of talk about what we've recently played, I'd like to throw out a little mini game about this. And uh, this time, uh, we have kind of another twist on it. This time, I'm going to go in reverse order. Scott, I'll start with you. So if you had to, for some reason, change something about one of the other two games that were discussed, you know, like you were sending them to a parallel dimension, but you got to have something a little bit different in that parallel dimension or else it's the same as this dimension. Come on. So if you're sending them to that parallel dimension, if there's one thing then that you had to change about one of those two other games, which game would you pick and what would you change? Ooh, man, that's a tough question. Uh, so if I had to change one thing about A Fake Artist Goes to New York or Seafall in a parallel universe, what would I change? I, I would say uh, in a parallel universe, and this is purely my conjecture and it is not fact, so please don't anyone quote me on it. Of course. Um, I believe that Rob Davio had been pulled in many different directions while creating Seafall. And I think that he had to lean on a lot of help from developers for Seafall. And I think that in the end, I probably would never have announced that Rob Davio was involved with Seafall had I known it would take that long. Because mm-hmm. like you said that you had it on your wish list for like two years. I feel as though Seafall kind of has a bit of the Phantom Menace marketing attached to it that oh my goodness, it's a Phantom Menace. It's the first movie we've had for Star Wars in like decades and it's going to be amazing and oh my God, it's terrible. <laughs> and I think that's kind of what happens with a game like Seafall is that if it takes too long to come out and there's all this hype around a great designer and, and unique concept and unique look and feel, it's hard to live up to the hype. So I, I don't know if that qualifies or quantifies as a correct answer for what you're looking for, but... Uh, I guess my answer would be maybe either not take so long to get Seafall out or, you know, just maybe not announce Rob as part of it until later. No, I think that's a valid answer. You know, if that would have helped reduce the hype and therefore allow the game to stand on its own a little bit stronger. Uh, so no, that, that's that's good. That, that's a good enough answer that um, in future discussions, I'm going to pretend I came up with it. So, <laughs> so there we go. Uh, Ryan, same question over to you. I think... I, I haven't played Hero Realms yet. I played Star Realms when it first came out just a few times, so I'm not super well-versed with the uh, with the system. But I like the idea of a kind of medieval deck builder like that, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Hero Realms does not have a lot of player progression with your character, does it? No, your character's pretty much your character. I mean, the progression is building your deck. Yeah, exactly, aside from the deck building. Um, I think that might be an interesting element that might make me even more interested in trying Hero Realms is if, in addition to your deck with new abilities that you can be adding to over the course of the game and trying to be able to, you know, attack with, if you had some type of augmented abilities or powers that were, uh, you know, kind of detached from your deck as well that you could, your deck could empower. Uh, And I say this kind of coming from a mindset of having played uh, A Big Book of Madness, I think is what it's called, from Yellow. Uh, earlier this year and as someone who's not a huge fan of cooperative games I played that game and was super disappointed at the end that it was not a competitive game I loved the system and I loved its mechanism of having like your deck building of your ingredients and then your separate list of kind of your powers and what you could do and your deck empowered those powers to actually go off I thought that was a really neat system I just wanted to do it against people and not with people (laughs) so I think if Hero Realms had something like that I think I would uh I would be way more excited about it. How about you, Chess? I'll take Fake Artist Goes to New York uh, because when I have played it, you know, each artist draws one line and I've wondered how much of a difference it would make in the game if each artist was allowed to draw two lines on their turn. A small, subtle little difference, but I'm wondering how much of an impact that could have on the gameplay. And I guess the other thing would be too, um, comparing it to Spyfall again, Spyfall in addition to trying to choose your location, 
you, each player also has a different role they could be playing. Like if you're in a hotel uh, environment, someone could be the bellhop, someone could be working the front desk, someone could be the chef, etc. And we've had mixed results using those roles. But having them as an option, you know, adds another kind of layer available to the game. And I don't know of anything like that in The Fake Artist Goes to New York. So maybe, you know, variable player powers or roles to play while you're drawing, if that could somehow be smushed into it, it, it would be interesting to see how, how that could be made to work. That, that leads us kind of into our main topic that, for discussion today, uh, shrinking games, or, or more specifically, taking some of these themes and mechanisms and finding out, is there ways to reduce and compress the gaming experience down to something that is as portable as possible? And what got me thinking about this uh, was, um, at BGGCon, demoing one of the games that we were demoing at BGGCon was Pocket Madness, uh, which is basically uh, I was introducing it to people as Rummy for gamers. It's based on the fundamental Rummy concepts of building straights and sets, but also you have uh, variable powers with the seven different elder gods that you can collect and you can use their powers once they're in front of you, and you have madness uh, that you're giving to other players. You have all of these layers of quote unquote gamer concepts and mechanisms that are added to the basic rummy engine of Pocket Madness. And the end result is a highly portable game uh, that's relatively simple to teach, but still captures that feel and theme and experience of playing a Cthulhu game. Uh, and, and the fantastic artwork in this game doesn't hurt either. I, I love the art in, in, in Pocket Madness. It takes that Cthulhu yeah, theme amazing. and yeah, it adds kind of almost a cutesy, ador no, adorable is the better word for almost an adorable feel to some of the, the imagery in it. So I wanted to turn that over to you guys for some examples you might have of games that have taken these larger themes and, and streamlined them and kind of talk about what works and what doesn't work in that process. Well, I'll jump in. I'll say I think that it can work, and I think there's times where that can fail, and I've experienced both. Uh, I think, not to be too self-serving here, but I think Pocket Madness does a really great job of capturing that kind of H.P. Lovecraft feel uh, because of the art and the, the thematic of, of you know giving madness and driving everyone else crazy through your, through your actions. I think that works really well, but I've got recent examples of things where someone took a larger mechanism or a larger theme or a larger game and distilled it down into something smaller, and it just kind of didn't really fire. You guys may remember at BGG, I think you guys were both there, uh, and we played the Broom Service card game. It definitely felt like they took that mechanism and tried to make a more portable version of it, and it just kind of fell flat for our group. Um, I've since played it again, and I think it's okay. It moves a little faster once I knew how to play it, uh, and we weren't all kind of scratching our heads initially. But um, but overall, it was just lacking compared to a larger experience with the same thing. Um, what do you think causes it to be lacking? Is it because they um, simplified the rules or because they actually removed certain aspects of the game or, or, or what kind of led to the difference between regular broom service and, and the card game version? Yeah, I think for me it was the removal of the game board and that kind of area, not really control, it's not really an area control game, but, but having that board of, uh, of having something a little more tactile to move around and a little more tangible with the potion delivery instead of just the set collection element that the cards represent. Um, it just felt, and, and maybe if I'd played the card game first and then gone up to the board game, it would have been a different experience, but going from playing the board game to playing the card game made the smaller game feel a little worse. Now, Pocket Madness is, of course, mechanically not built off of a larger game. It's actually kind of gone the other direction. It's taken a simpler game, which, like you said, would be rummy, and added more mechanisms to it, which I think is why maybe it works a little bit better. So maybe adding more to something can work, but taking a larger experience and trying to crush it down may not always work. Um, we talked a little bit before this call about you know games or mechanisms or themes or what have you that we might want to try to see compressed, and uh, I had brought up uh, Istanbul as one of my favorite games to play, period. And I just got at BGG the new uh, Letters and Seals expansion. Love it. It's great. Um, and I would love to have a little more portable, something I could throw in a backpack or throw in my pocket 
uh, kind of version of that same type of modular board with area control and uh, and kind of bouncing around, you know, collecting resources and so forth. Uh, I really like that system. But the more I think about it, since we even talked about it just a little while ago today, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would actually be better. It might just be a version that makes me want something larger. And I think that's like, you know, if you, if you put Rummy in front of gamers, they're going to get that same kind of feel of, well, it's okay. It's a good old fashioned solid game, but it could just be more, which I think is where Pocket Madness might be you know, able to excel. That's a good point you mentioned about the Istanbul expansions too, uh, Scott. Was it was it you at BGGCon that posed the question during some discussion where someone asked, "Think of all the games you have in your collection, and then think of all those games that have expansions." Yep. That now, was me. <laughs> okay, yeah, and, and you said something like, "Name three expansions that are absolutely critical that you couldn't live without," and everybody had a hard time coming up with that. Right. Well, I, I, the actual I think was uh, name five expansions that have improved upon the gameplay. Most expansions are I'm going to give you more of what already exists and doesn't necessarily improve upon the gameplay. And what what kind of game do you have an example um, that fits into this? Sure. Kind of thought. So one of my favorite games of all time uh, is a game called Zulkin, uh, which is a worker placement game that is uh, built around the manipulation of time. And I, I love that. I love the concept that time is a resource because I, I firmly believe in real life that it is the most valuable resource we have. And I think it's very interesting when games try to incorporate time as a resource, not necessarily as you have three minutes to do this or one minute to do that, but the way that Zolkin does in that you place a worker on a rondelle and you then know in a certain number of turns, you're going to want to try to take them off to capitalize uh, and minimize or maximize your, your efforts. And it does it very, very well. I, I really believe it's one of the better worker placement games that's out there. Uh, there's probably people that will tell me I'm crazy and wrong, but that's okay. That's why everyone has their own opinions. Um, <laughs> for me, I, I would love the concept because I, I again, the, the kind of the trifecta that you hit home earlier with around Pocket Madness being uh, small and portable, number one, being simplistic and approachable gameplay, number two, and being beautiful artwork and components, number three, that kind of makes the perfect pocket experience and and for me the artwork in uh pocket madness well you did use the adorable word is is very very good uh Mathieu Lesen, who is the the artist uh, also drew one of my favorite games jamaica uh, and his art is mm. really really good and that that shines through in pocket madness same thing with zolkin I, I think the artwork for zolkin is very eye-catching and very unique and I would really like to see that in a, a portable framework um, but I would really like to see the concept of time-based resource management in a, a portable game to be able to take with you. Because if you think about it in an existential way, um, pocket gaming, uh, whether it's Pocket Madness or any other kind of game that you're taking with you, is really built around time. And it's all built around, I, I want to play a game, but I don't have two hours or maybe even an hour to sit down and do this, but I want to bring it with me and play over the next 20, 30 minutes. So incorporating time into shrinking down uh, a concept, I think, Zulkin is perfect. Just to, to elaborate on what you said about time as a resource, and I'm pretty sure I'm following, but just for listeners and for the sake of this discussion, you don't mean a real-time game where you were literally no. timed with a clock. No. But you mean, you know, you have a finite amount of time within, a, you know, a value and you are depleting that value as you take actions or whatever, right? Right. Like, if you look at right. Zulkin, you know, you know how many times around the... the the board or how many, how many years you're going to spin that, that wheel, that rondelle. Right. So, you know, you only have a certain amount of time to be able to take advantage of your actions. Um, yeah, there's a bit, there's a big difference. We can probably do a whole nother segment around, uh, time as a resource versus time as a mechanic, right? If you, if you have an egg timer, for example, uh, you know, Pictionary. Pictionary is a great example. If you, if you play Pictionary and you flip over your egg timer and you have one minute to draw all these pictures, while time is technically Dr. Evil air quotes a resource, it's really a mechanic of the game. Whereas with Zulkin, it, it's truthfully the, the resource you have to manage. So what about you, Chaz? What, uh, what examples have you got? What thoughts do you have on shrinking or maybe growing a smaller game? 
Well, this branches right off from Scott's uh, portion of the discussion, uh, you know, talking about uh, having that, capturing that experience in as small and portable a package as possible. I actually had two examples that kind of worked together uh, because uh, I played Spartacus. Uh, my first and only game of Spartacus that I've played was uh, at a game club meeting a year or so ago. Now, granted, we played, I think it's a six player game, but we somehow ended up playing seven players and the person who was hosting it had homemade or grassroots expansions that he had added in that he'd printed off of board game geek so it was it was a very uh ex elaborate experience i guess i could say so on the other end of that uh last year i was introduced to this other game of gladiatorial combat uh called strike in, in which you have this little kind of a plastic bowl that it represents the arena and everybody starts with eight or so different dice and on your turn you throw the dice are your gladiator glad, gladiators and on your turn you throw your gladiators into the into the arena where they fight and you know you if you roll based on what you roll you'll actually uh, some of your gladiators will die and be removed from the game and some will come out and be added back to your dice pool and basically the person with the last gladiators standing wins it's a completely different genre of game. Dice game versus, you know, cards and minis and money. Uh, so totally different genres, totally different mechanisms. But still, these two games, to me, kind of can give me that same feel as long as I'm willing to get into the mindset. And, you know, one is vastly more compact to the other. <clears throat> and if you guys are buying that, uh, that leads me to the question about the discussion I wanted to ask you guys. If we're going to take a game and make it more portable and, and shrink it down more, when does a game shrink down to the point where it loses its core essence? Uh, I think it just probably depends on, on the game. And there's certainly a line there that you will cross and you'll kind of lose that original feel. Uh, I think once you start distilling things down to text and numbers, that's where you really start losing the essence of whatever the theme is you're trying to portray. Yeah, I would say when things don't make sense. When you, if you get into game design and you get into a position where you're like, hey, we could make this a pirate game just as easily as we could make this a space game, just as easily as we could make it a game about boxing kangaroos. I think when you get to that point, you've probably, probably gone too far. I, I like that. When, when things... Boxing when kangaroos? Apply... Yeah, I like boxing kangaroos too. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to the boxing kangaroos, I, I also I, I like the concept of, of when the theme that's applied to it no longer matters or no longer makes sense. When, when you cross that line, like I said, where you could just plug in any theme, I, I think you've lost a little bit of the essence of what that theme wants to be. And I think it's not just the fact that you can plug in any theme. It's the fact that you and your design team may become detached from it, right? Because quite frankly, I mean, you could apply a vast majority of themes to a vast majority of games. You, you could take Arkham mm -hmm. Horror and sure. immediately turn it into an Indiana Jones game with, with you know, tweaks to the, the feel and the genre and the, the style of things. So it's not to say that... Sure. Any of these games can just, you know, completely wipe a theme off and wipe another theme onto it. But it's the, the thought process of, like for me, with Pocket Madness, I love the concept of what each of the three actions are called, right? While, while you're mm -hmm. playing and melding a set and you're playing and melding a run and you're looking for more cards, it's, it's the concept of I'm continuing my adventure or I'm opening a portal to one of the Elder Gods or I'm publishing my research. And thematically, that all connects to being an investigator in this Cthulian horror land of H.P. Lovecraft. And whenever I do publish my research, it drives my opponents mad. And, and that thematic kind of sewing together of, of the concepts really hits home for me. And when you can pull that all together in a $20 game that you can take with you, that's really cool. Um, you know, it, it's it's something that as a designer, you know when and where that line gets crossed usually, or hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully. yeah. <laughs> well, not to keep uh, expanding the discussion <laughs> on shrinking games, but was there anything else that you guys wanted to add to that before we move on to our final question of the episode? We need a little ding counter for every time Chaz makes a pun. 
It would just be, you know, every, you know, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> we could have an over under. Yeah. We should, we should ask fans Ooh. instead of just sending in your questions, what's the over under on the next episode of how many puns Chaz is going to have? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to end with today's question. Today's question continues this theme of shrinking things. So um, basically, it's pretty straightforward. Using any game of your choice within the entire scope of the Passport Game Studios game catalog, if you had one game that you could take and revise to produce a pocket edition of, what game would you pick? Uh, I would probably pick Apollo 13. Uh, Apollo 13 is a not necessarily a big game, like physically from us, um, but it's a game that involves a couple of different decks of cards and uh, playing things, ironically, at, at the right time. Uh, going back to my Zolkin comments about time being a resource versus a mechanic, uh, most people are familiar with the Apollo 13 mission and, and the dangers and the risks and what happened during it. I think it could be a really cool theme and a really cool objective to put into a pocket game that, again, you can escalate the tension by making it that pocket-sized version of we have to get these guys home safe and, and make sure everyone is alive. Uh, I think that could be a really, really good one to uh, shrink, so to speak, in terms of uh, physical size and gameplay to still come through with a, a really fun experience like the main tabletop game does. I, I think that's actually a really good candidate for that type of uh, revision. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? Um, I want to go to my default answer for everything, which is always Food Chain Magnate, because I just love the game. But I feel like removing anything from that will just cause that whole giant house of cards to tumble. So instead, I think I would be intrigued to see a condensed version of Quantum, uh, which I think would be pretty reasonable to do without losing much of the core game. Uh, if you take out the tiles and, and just physically shrink everything down, I think you could make a pocket version of that without losing a lot of the same mechanisms since you would have the ability to use dice to still move around a modular board that would just be cards. Um, you know, you could have your, your player aids still, but but there's not a lot of excess stuff that I don't think could be done in a more pocket version and have that neat dice management area control -y type of system. I think that one would be really cool. All right, that's that, That's a good one, too. And uh, I, I actually think that has a lot of potential to work in that way. Yeah. Your answers make my answer look like garbage. Um, you, you know when you get a pair of jeans and it has that little pocket inside the pocket, you know, in the front? Um, sure. You know, like maybe a quarter fits in that, but nothing else. <laughs> um, I, I was going – I would like to make a pocket version of Pocket Madness – um, so that it would be so small and so condensed, it would actually fit in that little pocket within a pocket in your jeans, giving that a purpose. Nice. Um, so, so, yes, that's why I picked Pocket Pocket Madness. So, so. we Pocket Madness. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. I would be curious to hear what our listeners would like to have a shrink down. If there's a game in the catalog that they love, that they have an idea they could shrink down, that would be a cool question to ask. So yeah. let it be written, so let it be done. Uh, by the time this episode airs, I'm sure that if anyone listening goes to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Passport Game Studios, they'll find that very question. Again, using the uh, my resource of time to go and do that in the future. <laughs> Ta -da. Thank you both for joining me again for this episode, and I look forward to speaking with you both again real soon. Goodbye, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, it's been a great time. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Jess. We invite you to continue the discussion about the topics discussed in this episode over at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Passport Game Studios and on Twitter where we are at Passport Games. And be sure to add the hashtag, hashtag PGS Podcast. We welcome your questions and comments and may even feature them on an upcoming episode. So contact us and let us know what's on your mind. But for now, thank you all so much for joining us for this episode of the Passport Game Studios podcast. We'll see you again in two weeks to explore another topic about board games and the board game industry. 
In the meantime, we'll also be posting some game overviews and playthroughs on our YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash Passport Game Studios. Until then, thanks for joining us, and remember that not only board games, but life too, is a journey where adventure awaits.